Hey guys, it's Julesy, and I was not going to do a review on this episode of <sighs> Underground. I was just so annoyed. But I'm trying to be consistent. I'm keeping up with my dedication to doing a weekly review of Underground. I need you to definitely thumbs up this video. It helps because these videos don't get a ton of views. But And as always, support Smart Brown Girl by becoming a patron and making a pledge to my Patreon account. And or shop smartbrowngirl.com. And I have two books, The Other Forcey Natural Hair Guide and my collection of short stories to it on. They are now both available on Amazon if you want to get a hard copy of the 4C Natural Hair Guide. It is available though, it's only $5 for the PDF version and it's really not that long. But I figure since it's illustrated and all that, someone just happens to want the, it's not that it's hard copy, it's still paperback, but if they want an actual printed edition of it, it's now on Amazon and it's international shipping. So, everybody don't like ebooks. <sighs> so many things, I, mean, I literally wake up at like 7.30 and out here it is 10.30 and I'm still working and my to-do list is nowhere near shortened. But let's get into this episode of Underground called Graves. I believe this is episode eight. Is it episode eight? I understand that anytime you indulge in fiction, whether it's reading, um, reading literature, or watching a show, part of being an audience of a piece of fiction is a willing suspension of disbelief. I feel like yesterday's episode really kind of pushed the limits to how far my willing suspension of disbelief in how much I'm willing to forgive it being a TV show, so everything isn't going to be as realistic. But this is based off of history, this is based off of something that literally did happen. But yesterday, just a lot of things happened in the episode, and I'm like, I don't, I don't, I don't get it. Like, how? The, the ability for August and this new white boy slave catcher to track down things is just spectacularly uncanny. But even before we get to them getting to the morgue I guess. The amount of noise they made getting out of the tombs was like uh all right. The stealing of the dress, the kind of walking about town, it just I I I okay okay all right we're gonna go with this. I am happy to hear that they made it to Kentucky. I really had to like look up a map and see how far that is. That's far. For Rosalie and Cato to really believe that they could one steal clothes put this big ass petticoat, heavy clothing on, not nobody noticed, and then gallivant about town in Kentucky as free Negroes. Like there is a large bounty on both their heads and Cato has the most obvious of scars ever. Like half his face is melted off. If August and this other slave catcher is able to get to Kentucky on horseback that quickly, why wouldn't the news be able to carry that quickly of what these runaways look like? Not only did they walk up as Negroes with huge bounties on their head to this white man's house, but he was willing to see them. I, I'm trying to figure out what the long game is here. You know, kind of what was the whole point of that whole parade? Because it just was super unrealistic. One, that they could bust out of the graves without anybody noticing them, that they could go into a store, steal clothing, not be seen, and then walk about town straight up to the house and it's not like people live in like close quarters. Typically people live on land, they, those big houses, they live on miles of land. So for them to just kind of walk about and get all this done, I'm just, I'm like, all right. If I'm going to stretch my imagination this far, I just feel like it needs to go somewhere. And that for me really didn't go anywhere unless, you know, you got joy out of hearing Journey Somali news. Yeah, August's son is kind of like wearing him down, right? And I guess his son is supposed to be like, I honestly don't even trust the son's kind of innocence. I'm waiting for the point. For now, his character is kind of working to show what I've constantly been talking about, how August isn't necessarily, I mean, he's racist, but he's not racist in the same form of the wealthy white man and that he is a poor white. And to him, the racism is kind of more of a form of like genuine survival in that he really does see black people as cattle because that's a way for him to make money and therefore preserve the land, a little bit of house he has. So I'm flat out telling him, you know, you chose the easy option out. I, well, how insightful little white boy. And then it turns out that August himself can't even read, which just puts him in like, I, this is all reiterating how it's the poor white people who benefit the least from the system that do the most work to uphold this system. And when he goes to Odu and asks him to read the letter and the guy says Mercury and then he correlates it to gold and he's like, you know, the bank will probably buy it back for more than it's worth. I don't trust it. 
it's too easy. It's too easy of a vehicle. And now we're here, there's gonna be a second season. It just, it seems too easy. But you know, who knows where this is gonna go. I personally feel like the old white skinny white boy was lying to him. Disappointed me the most about the whole episode is I, I don't, I, I, I have so many questions about what was the purpose of Samuel. We are seeing Tom making the, the politicizing of the endorsement of slavery. And a lot of those lines the men were saying in the parlor, those were lines, I think, I feel like they were directly lift, lifted from the South Carolina Constitution or when South Carolina wrote the letter um, dissenting from the Union. I get the purpose of that imagery with Samuel hanging from the front of the house like that in front of the United States flag. I mean, again, this is that was a, like direct. Pa I've seen that painting before. Isn't there a guy who did a painting like that? I get where they're going with this, but I didn't understand necessarily the vehicle in which they put Samuel in to get to this point. In that Samuel was presented as one making like one of his favorite slaves. He's one of his most skilled slaves. One of his most hardworking slaves. He is the son of Ernestine. He didn't take the chance to run away the first time. And he wasn't trying to buy his freedom. He was trying to buy his brother's free freedom. And we didn't really kind of see any sort of indication of change when he was having that conversation with Macon and Macon said, oh, I'll think about it. He knows that his running away is only to the detriment of the family members that he leaves behind and that the punishing is probably gonna come down on his little brother and possibly Ernestine. So for him to run away and then not really run away, just run up the street to the next white man to ask him if he can pay him $100 for freedom, knowing good and god darn well that the, uh, the, his sister and the other slaves are on the run, there's a bounty for $500 on their head. What is a, and, and, and make it already told you how much you're worth to him. How you go into the county, whatever, is it the county sheriff, whoever this fat white man is, how you think he gonna care anymore about you? And uh, he, he was in the place to have interactions with these white people because he was a builder. And if he had the means to raise the funds in the first place and that white people were paying him as a slave for the furniture he was building, then he would have had the opportunity to interact with white, these white men again. Why at that point in time couldn't he be like, um, can I buy my freedom from you? It just, this, this didn't, I don't believe Samuel is this dumb. I can't accept that he was that naive. I get what they're trying to say about Christianity. I get all the references, no matter how much of a character this reverend is. And my man is so evil. You know, Ernestine, the, the ride and survive, and her willingness to cut off her own son's foot so that she knows he, he will still heal properly. And as much as I love Ernestine, as much as I love her character, I really don't agree with her kind of train of thought in that scene where Samuel is like I'm ready to die and she was like no you need to live and it's like well if we're gonna stay and we're gonna play this game what really is the point of living I feel like her asking him to, to live and to put up with getting his feet cut off is a very selfish act for her you know it's just that that is her child and I didn't get a lot of the setups that were happening in this episode I don't know why Ernestine feel so bold considering everything that's happening knowing that the reverend is still around and this man has it out for her and I low-key think Samuel was hung because he is the son of Ernestine I get that the 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 showing of the lynching the showing of kind of how the, this fear this illicit fear that white men have in black people I'm not annoyed to the point where I'm not gonna watch the show you know it's just working my nerves it's so suspenseful I'm just so ugh. Ugh, but can we can we just not I don't need to see nobody die. I don't even want Kato to die as, as annoying as Kato is as ready as Kato, Kato is to kill everybody else I really just I don't know that I want to see anymore almost like what's the point of the story you know because we haven't actually seen that much of how the underground works it'll be interesting to see how they wrap this up in the next two episodes let me know your thoughts in the comments down below let me know and I will see you next week deuces